All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Lee McDonald, Assistant Superintendent, West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District. I want to welcome you to our first parent university event of the school year. I hope you and your family are doing well. Uh, the purpose of this event tonight is obviously to talk about school security. Uh, I'm welcome uh, and, and joined by uh, a number of panelists here, which I'll introduce in a minute. The purpose of this presentation is really to give you as parents, as community members, a high level overview of safety and security uh, across the district, um, whether that's things that we do with our students in particular to prepare for certain situations, whether that's the number of significant uh, upgrades that we've made as a district in the last five to 10 years. We're going to share that information to you. We are recording this presentation, so we'll make sure in the coming days that we will post that on the district web page uh, via YouTube. Uh, additionally, uh, we will take questions at the end. The chat feature is open. Uh, you may ask questions as we go along, and then at the end, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions as best we can, certainly anything that we don't get to this evening, we will make sure that uh, you have every opportunity to get your questions answered as a follow up. So with that being said, I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to do some quick introductions. Uh, Chief Garfalo, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, West Windsor Police Chief. I'm Rob Garofalo. I'm the Chief of West Windsor Police. I've been with West Windsor 34 years and uh, here to help with any questions you may have. And you can always reach out to me by email uh, after the presentation. And no, that is not where I'm at right now. That is a fake background. Thank you for that clarification. I'm uh, Officer uh, Latham. I'm West Windsor Township. I've been there almost 11 years. Um, I started my career somewhere else and then uh, um, came to West Windsor and I'm uh, in charge of the class threes uh, in, in the West Windsor Township Schools. Great, thank you. Yep. My name is Marty McElrath. I'm a sergeant with Plainsboro Police. Um, I'm in charge of our class three program. Uh, I've been here for 15 years. Um, I spent five years as a juvenile detective, which was really my introduction uh, to the relationships with the schools. But uh, for the past five years or four and a half years now, I've been in charge of the Class 3 program. Okay, and Lisa, if you're still there, or we can introduce you a little bit later in our program. I can do a really quick introduction, Lisa sure. Lacaruba. I'm a family physician, and uh, I'm the Mercer County co-lead for the Be Smart program, and you'll learn more about me and our program in a little while. Great, thank you, Lisa, appreciate it. So with that being said, again, I'm Lee McDonald. I am an Assistant Superintendent for Pupil Services and Planning in the district. Uh, I also serve as a district school safety specialist and work collaboratively with each of our panelists that you see here this evening, in addition to others, our school administrators, our, our teachers, our counselors, um, everybody in between, parents, students. Uh, with that said, uh, if you look at this quote here in terms of uh, the realities that school districts and, frankly, uh, societies has to face in the last five, ten years, especially and when you go back to Sandy Hook, the tragedy that occurred there. When you think about Parkland, you think about uh, even Uvalde as, as recently as six months ago. Um, schools were never intended to be fortified, per se. Uh, as, as school administrators, as teachers, as counselors, we, we want to have our buildings as welcoming, engaging as possible. Uh, but the reality is we have to think about safety and security. And I can tell you as a, from a district perspective, um, safety and security is our number one priority with our students, with our staff, with our community. It's something that we take very uh, seriously. It's ultimately what we feel is a community responsibility, a shared responsibility. And that's that's what you're going to hear about tonight, our partnership with law enforcement and other organizations here. Uh, but we also uh, want to partner with you. We partner with our students. We want to make sure everybody understands what school security means. And that's really one of the goals of this evening's presentation. So if you have family, friends, neighbors that uh, were not able to log in tonight, uh, please share the link with them. We wanna make sure that our community is well informed. First and foremost, our collaboration with law enforcement is uh, a paramount uh, to us in terms of safety and security. When you think about the different facets that that includes, and I'm gonna certainly have my colleagues here uh, jump in here in a minute, but 
Um, it is a requirement in the state of New Jersey that there's a memorandum of understanding between the school district and local law enforcement. And what that means is that if there are incidents, if there are things that need to be addressed and communicated with law enforcement, we're required to do so. Truth be told, we don't need that requirement. We have great relationships with West Windsor and Plainsboro. We have regular communication with them. We share ideas. We share feedback with each other. They are all, they are really partners with us in making sure our schools are safe and secure. Uh, obviously, that includes regular communication and articulation. Uh, when we need police presence, as I'm sure you're aware, the first two weeks of school, uh, they've been present in every single one of our buildings. Additional presence over and above what they normally do to make sure that everybody not only is getting to where they need to be, uh, that traffic is as best as it possibly can be in terms of the flow, uh, but making sure that there's a presence within the community uh, and that they're seen and that they are visible partners with the district. Um, what you don't necessarily see is security walkthroughs that occur when those students aren't in our schools, right, to make sure that they understand uh, and they are familiar with our school settings, uh, where our classrooms are located, uh, our other uh, critical uh, response components, um, you know, our HVAC units, all of those things that go into operating a school building. We want to make sure that they're familiar with the territory, so to speak. Uh, and also our class three officers, we have class three officers in all of our schools. Uh, we are in our fifth year. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation, but that's also something that you see in every one of our schools uh, is a class three police officer. So if any of my colleagues want to jump in on that collaboration component, that would be great. Okay, very briefly, I know our class threes, have, like you said, we're going on our fifth year with that program. And I just understand that the class threes are an extension of West Windsor and Plainsboro Police Departments. Uh, they are police officers. They're fully trained. They're, they're designed to be there to be a, a part of the school system. And they are, are a branch of everything we do. So they're trained at the same training our officers get. They get the same uh, schools, the same everything, equipment, you name it, they're all part of that. And as you can see, you know, I'm proud to say with both you know, and I'm speaking for Plainsboro, but Marty, please let me know if um, uh, we have seen such a relationship come about with the class three officers where it's been a personal relationship. And I know there has been people in the past who have not really appreciated the idea of a class three, but even those people come to me on a regular basis and tell me, man, they have dealt with the class three officer and he or she, they're like the nicest person. Hey, they help my kid carry his cello out to it out to the car they they they're so polite this guy is such a gentleman and that's what i hear over and over and over again and that's really what we wanted from that program we're not looking for an enforcement branch of the police department we're looking for that community branch that interaction and god forbid we have that god forbid something happens we have that immediate insurance policy that we're doing everything we can to keep the kids safe yeah, Chief, Chief, I totally agree. I um, I think it's important to note that our class three officers, um, their approach has never been an enforcement approach. It's more of a guardian approach, and that's how they view the schools. And um, one thing that they bring to the table, and I, I know we're going to get into this a little bit later, but uh, they know the schools better than any um, anyone else we've ever had because they're there every day. They know the people. Um, they know everybody's names and. Uh, when they walk through the schools, if they see something out of place, you know, a regular patrol officer might not notice that. And we found that that's been very beneficial as far as building assessments and pointing out um, certain things that could be improved. So it's it's been a great program so far. We're, we're really happy with it. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and as I said before, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm everybody should know that every school in the state of New Jersey, uh, West Windsor Plainsboro, no different is required to have a school security plan, right? Obviously, I'm not going to speak to what those are and what those specifically mean, other than to tell you that they are preparedness plans when we have incidents, right? And those incidents could be uh, anything and everything that could potentially happen. You see some of them listed here, whether there's a bomb threats, a gas leak. Uh, part of that plan is, is detailing uh, for our staff and uh, those that are trained on these plans, our law enforcement, what our plan is, what are our critical response uh, protocols to those 
uh, situations. And that includes making sure each one of our staff members is trained and has an understanding of what the plan entails. Um, that starts with our building administration, working with our teachers, working with our, our child study teams, our counselors, our other support staff, our school nurses, all of those things. So it's important that everybody knows that they're updated annually. Uh, we have conversations over the summer about what it is that we need to adjust year to year based upon feedback from law enforcement, based upon situations that occurred that we learned from, right? So we're constantly evolving those plans, making tweaks to make sure they're as tight as they possibly can be. Uh, emergency response plan. This is uh, a fairly new uh, initiative from our state police uh, in working closer with schools with regard to um, additional plans and, and should there be any sort of uh, incidents. I'm going to ask uh, Marty to speak a little bit to what this means specifically for the school district. Sure. Um, so part of these plans, the emergency response plans, um, have a lot to do with uh, post event. So uh, active shooter crisis type events, um, they're very difficult to plan for and to write exactly how it's going to go because they're so dynamic. However, after an incident is, is stabilized to a certain extent, um, from that moment for the next, you know, 36, 48 hours, um, you can prepare for that a little bit. And that's what these plans are really about. Um, it's about getting as much information as you can about a school so that if you have a, um, an incident, the follow-up to that incident, the subsequent investigation, how we handle um, uh, reunification and how we collaborate with the schools in that process, uh, that that's on paper and that that's prepared for. Um, and that's really what these plans are about. And um, it's something that, that we're working on this year. Uh, you know, really, as we speak, we're working on that. Great. Thank you, Marty. Safety and security drill law. Just want to highlight that um, the state law does require every school district to do at least two drills a month. That includes a fire drill. That includes a security drill. I'll talk a little bit about what those drills are here in a second. Um, there are now additional requirements. You may have noticed within the last year or so that when we ran a school security drill, you may have received the message uh, via Genesis. Uh, and communication, just letting you know that a drill occurred right that day, um, you know, and, and so that's really important just in terms of the communication. You should also know that when we drill, and we drill in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different situations, um, we're not using props. We're not, we're not running around with uh, airsoft guns, right? We're, we're doing so. There is some order to it, but certainly we want to put students in different situations, whether that's a lunch period whether that's during passing time, whether that's from the classroom setting. So we try to practice those drills at different times of day. Again, if we're doing a security uh, drill, you're going to get communication as a parent letting you know that a security drill occurred. Uh, ideally for us, those drills are unannounced. And that is the best way to prepare our staff, to prepare our students so they don't necessarily know that it's coming. Uh, that said, when there have been uh, local, regional, national incidents, we've been very sensitive to that fact. And we have had times where we've announced our drills so that we were not, um, we're not causing undue panic, uh, if you will. So a little bit about the safety and security drill law. Um, in terms of what those drills are, you can see on here uh, the si six different types of drills that we practice as a district. Uh, again, um, a lockdown, you know, in, in that active shooter type worst case scenario, which none of us hope ever comes true here or anybody else, but sadly has become a reality uh, in our country. Um, there could be an intruder. What do we do, right? And what's our, what's our response? So we go through and we drill and we practice that scenario uh, with our students in the classroom so that they're aware with our teachers so that they're aware they know what the protocols are. Um, in evacuation, if there's a gas leak, there could be uh, you know, a loss of power, some sort of other threat. Uh, that we have to relocate our students, right, from one building to an X. Again, that goes back to that security plan, making sure that everybody knows where that relocation point is. Um, of course, fire alarms, pretty self-explanatory, right? We have uh, processes in place where we exit the building. We make sure that we're taking student attendance. We make sure that we're all clear. Uh, we have uh, uh, walkie-talkie communication. Um, and also know that our police departments in both townships they know when these drills are occurring. So there's regular communication, right? 
Uh, and we sometimes we have situations where they're present, right, to have to watch us do the drill to make sure that uh, we're doing the best we can. And they'll give us feedback on that, which is really critical. That's how we get better. Right. So they will pinpoint they'll actually be on site and they will pinpoint things that, hey, you know what, next time you may want to think about this. We'll debrief after the drill. Um, I, we noticed this. We noticed this person in this part of the building. You couldn't hear the announcement that was made, right? So that is critical feedback for us in terms of improving our drill process and ultimately doing the best we possibly can. Uh, shelter in place. If we have a shelter in place, um, it could be a, an outside uh, weather related scenario. It could be some other scenario that um, allows us to continue the school day, um, but doing so remaining in that particular classroom, in that particular room, wherever it is. So, you know, middle school, high school, we're not changing classes, we're staying put. So you could have an extended period for that. A lockout would be uh, something where, I don't know, there's a rabbit box or there's deer on the playground or some sort of threat where we are still moving around the building. Um, so we would still change classes. We're just not letting anybody in and we're certainly not letting anybody out of the building. So uh, the last one, of course, would be a medical emergency. Uh, should somebody have uh, some sort of uh, medical um, incident, uh, that's we have a process working with our school nurses and administration on who's on that team. Uh, they used to be called code blue teams to making sure that um, we're aware of where the AEDs are, right? Um, who's CPR certified, all of those components that come with a medical response to making sure our response is timely. Anytime that we do a drill, again, the communication with law enforcement is really critical. So they know when we are doing drills. Uh, additionally, if we have a lockdown drill or if we have a lockdown occurs in one of our schools, for example, there is automatic communication uh, that goes to both police departments. So they're notified, central office, myself, superintendent, Dr. Adderhall, are notified immediately so that we're aware of, of a situation that might be happening. Um, class three officers, we talked about this before um, in terms of uh, what they do for our schools. It, this is not just about fortifying our schools. Of course, that's the insurance policy, of Chief, as Chief Garfalo mentioned earlier. But for us, it's about community policemen. It's about engaging our families, our students, being present, maintaining that positive relationship with our students, um, supporting our crisis situations when they do happen, having somebody there present. Uh, that understands uh, firsthand. These are officers that are uh, recently retired. Uh, they have served 25, 30 years as active police, have extensive amount of training. Of course, our armed have to continue to update their training. Uh, we have regular meetings and communication with them to make sure that uh, they are aware of our security plans, our protocols and whatnot. I know um, uh, Dan Latham and Marty McElrath, they both have regular communication. They are our liaisons with our class three program. So it's really been a very positive uh, partnership over the last five years. We're in the fifth year. And beyond that, there's, there's really been some success stories. We've had class three officers save lives, right? When we've had uh, medical situations, we've had class three officers uh, during the pandemic uh, present every week uh, during food distribution. So it goes well beyond just the fortification of schools. Um, eyes on the door security. This is another uh, security element that we have at every school. This is our in-house security team uh, who is trained, again, familiar with our security protocols. Uh, they ultimately uh, are there front and center at the main entrance of the school. There's are also some other entrances where you might see them present. You know, if there's an evening event, uh, you know, on the backside of the school or secondary entrance that's being used for some different reason. Um, but they are there, first and foremost, to identify any potential threats uh, front and center of the building. Um, they are there, obviously, to manage our visitor protocols. Uh, that includes Raptor technology. Raptor is a software that we use as a district where if you come in as a parent, uh, you are uh, obviously, a, you need to be there, you, you need to have an appointment, right, or have been called to the school. There's got to be a reason to be there. We communicate that with our front office staff. But also, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're asking you to bring a license, proper identification. Uh, we're running your license through a database, through Raptor. That's what it allows us to do. If there are um, flags that come up, we have a conversation about it. We consult 
if we have to with law enforcement about why this individual is in the school. So that's a safety protocol uh, we adopted several years back. It's 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 really been a good thing for us. Uh, so we appreciate the community's um, willingness to to make sure that if you're coming into the building, you have proper identification and that you are um, uh, having that quick check in terms of the database. So I know there's some hands going up. Again, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We will definitely get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Security vestibules, what you see here, I'm going to move our, uh, hopefully you can see that picture. That's actually one of our security vestibules at Community Middle School. So as you're aware, we've had uh, a large referendum going back to 2015, 2016, tremendous amount, around, amount of construction throughout the district. Uh, that includes upgrades in every school to have a security vestibule, which allows us to have that person trap, right? So you're buzzed into the building. It's a secure area. You have to get your, your license, your identification checked. Uh, you obviously have to communicate what you, the reason you're there to school uh, to come into the building. And before, any, before a person steps into the building, uh, that's where they are. Uh, held until we go through that process of making sure they're there for the right reason. So again, a security vestibule, um, we're in the process of making sure all of our schools have them. I, I believe the only one at the moment that doesn't have one is Wyckoff, but we have uh, somebody there front and center, and we that will be a part of the construction that's currently happening at Wyckoff Elementary School. Um, so I mentioned the Raptor um, Raptor technology component. This is something that um, is, uh, I spoke to a minute ago, it's a database with regards to um, our um, license, running a, a license as people are coming in to identify themselves. Uh, they're screened against a custom database, including uh, any sexual offenders, right, that are part of that database. So it clarifies uh, who that individual is, uh, it identifies a red flag, and we go through that piece. So one question I did want to address, I, I mentioned the class three program in terms of saving lives, right, and what that meant earlier. And what I meant by that is um, we've, we've had situations where there's been medical emergency, and our class three officers uh, were there front and center to identify an individual that needed assistance, and that um, was able to get the medical attention that they need had that class three officer not been there as somebody that CPR certified, as somebody that has that background working in law enforcement, the training that they have. So I did want to clarify that. I mentioned that earlier. That's what I meant by saving lives. Um, we have not had incidents where we've had to use armed force and whatnot uh, in our schools, thankfully. So anything to date uh, um, from our panelists that you wish to add? I mean, not too much added in that direction. Uh, Marty, uh, definitely go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead, Chief. I was just going to touch on 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 that incident with the uh, with the medical emergency. That um, because of his years of service as as a law enforcement officer, um, he had witnessed uh, many people go into you know certain types of um, people who were having medical emergencies. He was able to identify that as it was coming on. So rather than you know postpone it or wait, um, getting medical treatment, you know he was able to immediately act. And in those situations, time matters. Um, you know, minutes matter, and 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 that's really what what made the difference in um, in getting that person the help that they needed. Yeah, and I think you know we're we're kind of looking at what's going on around the country right now, and really, I have to give it to the school system and everyone involved in the schools for the past five years we've had this stuff in place and we've been building on it and the schools have been working, partnering with us, which isn't easy to do when you have, you know, two police departments in two different counties and all the intricacies that are involved with that. This is a monumental undertaking, but look at the rest of the country now with everything that's going on, they are all waking up and saying, Hey, we need this. We, we need to put this in place where we've been doing it for five years. You know, let's face it. Every aspect of what we've been doing, everywhere else now wants to do it. And they're turning to us and other places like us and said, look what you've been doing for five years and how well it's been working. And knock on wood, it, it's phenomenal. And 
like you said, there's been medical, there's been so many other benefits to that interaction, including the community aspect of it, which for us, it's huge. Okay, understand the community aspect is, you know, we're teaching our kids that law enforcement is, is that community piece that we need and we're a part of. And also it works well for us. You know, we are benefiting from that as well because it gives us resiliency. It shows us the positive side of interacting with the public and interacting with friends and family and all the people we get to meet. So this, this program is, is just phenomenal uh, in, in every aspect of it. And I think it's really a testament to the, what the school has done and, and what they have, have put in place. And I just love also that the Raptor technology, I think we should have a big sign in the front of the school that says, you know, search by Raptor technology because that's, that's great. <laughs> Whoever came up with that name for the software is just phenomenal. <laughs> Chief, Chief, the only other thing I wanted to touch on was the uh, communication part. I know it was a slide earlier, and <clears throat> it's easy to kind of gloss over and say that we communicate well, but it goes beyond um, the Monday to Friday during the day. It goes beyond the occasional meeting or the emails back and forth. Uh, it really is a 24-7 thing. Um, when we have incidents that occur after school hours, uh, the communication is still there. Um, there's been times when we're on the phone at you know, 1, 2 in the morning, um, developing plans of action for an incident that occurred so that the next school day, we, we have something in place. And, and that occurs in the overnight hours. So it's not just communication when it's convenient, it's constant, it's 24 seven. Um, and I think that's really a testament to the school district and, and, and the relationship that we've been able to build between our police departments, um, the community and the school district, because it's really, everybody needs to be involved with that. And that's something I think that we really do a, a, um, a great job with. Thank you both for for jumping in on that. Agreed. Uh, it, it is a, a 24 seven uh, endeavor, but um, that's what we do for the safety and security of our students and staff and community. Um, security camera systems, I wanted to highlight that we have well over 700 security cameras across the district. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive as far as coverage goes. Uh, of course, they're a deterrent, um, but if we have an incident that occurs, uh, it gives us the ability to go back in time, so to speak, and capture something that may have happened, uh, understand an incident, uh, learn uh, how to respond appropriately and whatnot. Uh, but these camera systems are monitored by our class three officers. It's one of their responsibilities. Uh, obviously, there, our administration uh, has access to these cameras. Um, so there's something that we use on a regular basis to monitor, uh, on not just in the schools, but the exterior. Uh, of the schools as well in common areas and whatnot. Um, with that said, our law enforcement in, in both townships has access uh, to those exteriors. So they can see in live time something that's happening uh, at a, a particular building and if necessary, uh, respond accordingly. So it's really important. Um, it's a cloud-based system so we can access it 24 seven from anywhere that we have uh, an internet connection. Uh, the officers can actually uh, access it, anybody, we can access it on our phones. So it really is uh, a state-of-the-art tool that allows us to make sure that we're constantly monitoring our facilities and our school grounds. School-wide lockdown capabilities. I mentioned the lockdown uh, process earlier as one of the drills in that, um, that, that situation we hope we never have to really do. Uh, but as a district, uh, one of the technologies that we've invested in heavily uh, is uh, the ability to lock down from any school phone. Uh, that includes phones in the classroom, that includes phones in the main office. Every school has a uh, specific code to their building. Our staff is trained on how to do this. We do exercises with them. Um, that really helps uh, having that response time. I, I think Marty mentioned it. That response time is so critical, not just to a medical incident, but if there is that situation that none of us hope happens, we wanna make sure that law enforcement is instantly notified, which is as soon as the building goes into lockdown, uh, there are multiple people that get those notifications so that they can respond accordingly. Of course, if it's a drill, they're also aware that that's a drill as well. 
Um, but that's really something when you talk about response time is instantaneous as soon as something happens. There's an immediate response from law enforcement. Uh, there are also school-wide audio and visual announcements. So if a child is hard of hearing, um, if a child is blind, there are different components that uh, can be are added, right? Flashing lights, there's announcements that are automatically made. It literally takes over our system and makes those announcements throughout the school building so that everybody immediately is aware. Uh, it's not relying on a human being to make the appropriate announcement, right? It's automatic so that there's no human error. As soon as that code is put in, uh, the, immediate, the, the building immediately goes into lockdown. As I said, we drill that all the time, different scenarios so that our students and our staff understand how to respond. Um, I don't know if anything uh, to add on that uh, from law enforcement side. Uh, just just the one um, other advantage as far as like reducing the response time is with the class threes in there as well. Um, they are a trained law enforcement officer with you know, decades of experience uh, with the police radio. So it's not just the actions that they take in a, in a crisis event. It's the observations they make and then the, the way they relay that information directly to our dispatchers and other responding officers. Um, that information is critical and it helps us respond in a better way um, because they're already in the building. And, and that's a distinct advantage that we have as well. Agreed, well said. Again, having that presence on the inside, so to speak, immediately gives us that ability and that immediate response time. Um, and as I said before, when we get feedback from law enforcement all the time in terms of how we're doing things and we wanna get that feedback, it's critical for us to improve our practices as best we can. Um, school threat assessment team. This is a, a new uh, law that went into effect for the start of the 22-23 school year. Essentially requires every school in the state, every public school to have a school threat assessment team. Uh, and what that means, every school right now has a crisis response team. We've had those for years, right? Where we have uh, particular individuals with a background and expertise. You have, might have an administrator, a child study team member, a school counselor, um, other people that have extensive train, training and, and, and responses um, that sit on those committees. But this is new and this is more specific to if there is a specific threat made to the building that could come externally, that could come internally, uh, that could be something that uh, a student did or said. That's That could be something that was posted on social media that we don't know who posted it, right? There's any number of situations and the whole idea is to get um, the meeting of the minds to to go through a process where you're asking essential questions about what that risk is of course when we have these situations communication with law enforcement is really critical we're always leaning on them to say what's your perspective on this you know what is our response here we want to make sure that law enforcement has a line we have that lens around it uh, to identify something that we're not perhaps thinking about but this is new in place but i will tell you it's been our practice for number of years. So the responses that are now required, the think tank, if you will, that schools are now required to have. I go back to what Chief Garfalo said, we've been doing this for several years. Um, our counselors are trained, our administrators are trained. Of course, new trainings are coming out all the time. Uh, we continue to be a part of those trainings from the state level, from the Department of Emergency uh, Planning and Response, uh, down to local trainings with our law enforcement as partners. Critical response policy 8468. I'm not, obviously not going to go through the whole process, but this is this is also a policy that we've recently updated. Um, that if we have a situation, uh, it it gives us the, a, a little bit more of a leg to stand on in terms of making sure that we can do everything we possibly can to address a particular situation. One besides doing what I just spoke about, critical response in terms of the threat assessment team. If we have a scenario where we have an individual that potentially could be a threat uh, to our school community. Um, we're working with that family, that individual, of course, but we're also involving law enforcement. And we're also making sure that um, we're removing that threat uh, as soon as possible and addressing that accordingly. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's always punitive, right? It could be an individual that needs counseling. It could be an individual that needs some additional uh, support outside of the district, right? So there's a lot of different scenarios that that falls under, uh, but our critical response policy, making sure that we're abiding by 
best practices. And these are things that we're constantly looking at as a district. How do we improve our practices? But more importantly, how do we make sure that we have Board of Education approved policies and regulations that outline specifically what it is that we do, how we respond, uh, and how we handle certain situations and what we can uh, do to make sure that we're we're keeping safety and security first and foremost. foremost. Um, another uh, feature that we have in district, Gaggle software, um, you may have heard this term, you may not, but um, we've had Gaggle for quite a number of years. And essentially what it does is it monitors our district used devices uh, that our students, that our staff has. And this is not meant to be a gotcha software. This is meant to support students, support individuals that may need help, right? Oftentimes students, if they're in distress, they're going to reach out to a teacher. They're going to communicate with their friend. They're gonna communicate with their counselor or their child study team case manager. This allows certain uh, words, uh, it runs off an algorithm uh, to be flagged and we are instantly notified. Uh, the administration, the district administration, myself and several of my colleagues, uh, school administration, so that we can look into a situation immediately, right? So we're not finding out 12 hours later at the start of the school day, or we're not necessarily finding out uh, from law enforcement after an incident happened. If we're reviewing that incident um, and we're, we're there to support the family, to support the student, uh, to work with law enforcement, if we do have a situation that comes up, if there's a threat, of course, again, we're reconvening that team. It doesn't matter if it's three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, right? We're gonna work through that. We're gonna be notified. We have multiple people that are on these notifications so that our, again, our response time and our ability to, um, to, to either get somebody help or to address a potential threat to the school district is really important. And that's what Gaggle allows us to do. Um, another great support, uh, we've had a partnership with Rutgers University Behavioral Health uh, for several years now. Uh, that means that we have four uh, uh, professionally trained uh, counselors, uh, mental health clinicians on site in the district. They serve schools K-12. Uh, these are a number of the things that they do uh, for us as a district, uh, whether that's providing an on-site crisis intervention and screening if a student has, for example, suicidal ideation, right? Or even homicidal ideation. We wanna get them in front of a mental health expert as soon as possible. Um, in those situations, we do uh, secure parent consent before we do that. We work with our counselors, our case managers who are extensively trained in how to identify. Um, these are also members of the crisis response, uh, the school threat teams uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they also help us in many cases secure services for an individual that might need outside therapeutic support. Uh, that could be a full inpatient, that could be a partial program. Um, whatever it is, they help us navigate the uh, mental health uh, support uh, field, and which is very daunting. That, that There's critical shortages of counselors out there, uh, but we're very fortunate to have this relationship with Rutgers University Behavioral Health to navigate uh, those situations with them and get our students uh, or other individual support as soon as possible. Um, they, of course, support other uh, other programming that we do around mental health uh, support, whether that's uh, supporting our school counselors, case managers, whether that's other evening parent universities. We've had them on uh, to educate our families on signs and symptoms. Uh, you name it, they, they do it. Other student supports I didn't want to fail to mention. Again, our school counselors, uh, I believe we have 34 counselors, 35 maybe, uh, give or take across the district K-12 at every level. We also have student assistance counselors that are specifically trained on substance abuse and awareness that have a special skill set. Um, our school counselors are an amazing team. They do a lot to support our students, our families, uh, of course, our teachers. When you talk about social emotional learning and whatnot, we have child study teams that also uh, support our students with special needs uh, throughout the district, again, K-12. Uh, our school nurses, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, be fully staffed with school nurses that also support uh, situations, right? Sometimes a student uh, may go into a nurse's office and something that they're thinking or feeling manifests themselves in, as, as an illness, right? And our counselors or 
any one of these individuals, including our school administrators, sometimes they're on the front line of getting that information and then ultimately being able to support a child and get them the help that they need. So we're really fortunate to have these resources uh, within our community. And I know there's a lot of questions. I promise I'm going to get through them here in a minute and answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. With that said, that's kind of part one of the presentation. I'm going to look through our questions and put those together for the end. Uh, but with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to talk about the Be Smart program. Uh, we appreciate her being on tonight with us to talk about gun safety, um, which is really important topic uh, for those of you that uh, have firearms in your possession. Lisa, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Lacaruba. As I said, I'm a family physician. I'm a mother of two. Um, and I really became interested in gun safety and promoting gun safety, not just for gun owners, but for all adults to help children. Um, because I saw the impact of gun violence, I treated patients who had been victims of gun violence. I treated families who have been, been victims of gun violence and impacted by gun violence. And I, after Sandy Hook, when my kids were about the same age as those, those children, it, it just really became personal that it's something that I really need to pay attention to. And I discovered the Be Smart program, which is a program developed by Everytown for Gun Safety Support Fund to bring together parents and all adults who are concerned about kids, guns, and safety. So welcome. I'm gonna play a short video. Hopefully this works. We're coming to the kids to say that adults, it's our responsibility to keep kids out of the hospital. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're yeah, going to I'm not sure, Lisa, I'm not sure if, if I know for me it cut in and out the volume. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. So I don't know if you want to try to, I don't know if that was something okay. you did or. No, I think it's just the way it shares. Sorry about that. At least it was only 45 seconds. It's basically just saying that this Be Smart movement is getting a lot of traction across the country, that we're all recognizing the need to keep our kids, to keep our kids safe. The fact is we all want kids to grow up happy and healthy. We have the right to make responsible decisions about how to protect our homes, families, and communities. And that includes whether or not to have a gun in our home. But if we can prevent even one child gun death or injury, it's our responsibility to do so. So this is not a discussion about laws or politics or policies. Let's, let's set those aside. When talking about gun violence, however, we also must break the silence around suicide. So we'll show these resources again later on in the presentation, but I just wanna share that before we begin talking about this topic, we're going to be talking about some stories of gun violence and suicide. And, and living through these experiences is devastating. Hearing about them can be devastating. So if this seems too emotional for you at all, and you need to step away to take care of yourself, you can do so. Again, I'll show these resources again, but please keep these resources in mind if, if you can become emotionally involved in this, um, in this topic, because it's a tough one. So like I mentioned, Be Smart is a program that is really gaining traction across the country. And I just want to share that in New Jersey, we've actually uh, partnered with local police departments to provide information to Be Smart, tabling at National Night Out. This is a little bit further north, but I will say in Mercer County alone, seven towns had representation where we had Be Smart tables at National Night Out with our law enforcement. In addition, the Be Smart message is on New Jersey State Police social media. I was not able to grab a screenshot of it, but 
I'll have that next time I do this presentation. Um, so we've worked with um, with Police Chief Callahan to to really get the Be Smart message out on a statewide level that it's very important and to understand that we work with law enforcement in in the sense that we are communicating the same message. One of the things that we keep in mind is that in the U U.S., um, firearms are the leading cause of death for children. This is a public health crisis. I say that as somebody who's looked at the data. I say that as a mom. I say that as a physician. Um, more than 1,800 children under the age of 18 are killed with guns every year. That's five children every day. The majority of those deaths, 54%, are homicide. That's 1,000 children a day that are killed with guns. In addition, 700 children die by firearm suicide every year, and another 100 are unintentionally shot and killed. So I'm here today to talk about how we can prevent these types of tragedies, because those numbers to me are just unacceptable. In addition, 4.6 million children in the U.S. live in a household with at least one loaded, unlocked gun. While school shootings and mass shootings are the ones that make the national headlines, most unintentional child shooting deaths occur in the home. And the Secret Service found that of those school shooters, three quarters of them acquired their firearm from the home of a parent or a close relative. So this is an emotional issue. We come from different backgrounds. Your parents, some may be gun owners, some may not be. Some may have had personal experiences with guns, positive or negative, and, and some may have been impacted by gun violence. But at Be Smart, we believe that most gun owners want to be responsible gun owners. So we're going to talk about what all of us gun owners and non-gun owners alike can do to make sure children and teens do not have unsupervised access to guns. So I wanna share that this is what the consequence of uh, unsecured guns looks like in our community. So these are some examples from kind of the, the circle around us. Um, in Newark, there was a fatal shooting of an eight-year-old. These are all new, they're all from 2021 and 2022. Um, fatal shooting of an eight-year-old. He accidentally shot himself with his uncle's firearm that was left lying around his residence in Newark. Um, locally, we know that a Lawrence High School student was faced charges of bringing a gun to school. This was a 15-year-old who had a loaded handgun in the school with the serial number filed, filed off. Um, we have a two-year-old who accidentally shot and killed his four-year-old sister while his father was pumping gas. Uh, the father's friend had just left a gun sitting in the car while he went into the store, and the two-year-old picked it up and shot his sister. We also know that we have a 16 year old who had a 23 year old friend. Um, the friend had a gun, 16 year old was handling it, taking pictures, videos of himself with it. Cause those of you who have 16 year olds like I do, that's what they do. And um, while he was doing that, he he shot the 23 year old who's, whose gun it was. So these are just some of our local headlines that show that this is what happens when kids get their hands on unsecured guns. And no story is the same, but all of these were preventable. So we can take action in our homes and our communities. If you don't have a gun in your home or if you do and you're already practicing secure storage, what can you do right now? We talk about be smart. So we'll go into what all these letters mean. So first we'll start with S. So I think you can guess what S is. S is secure. Secure your guns in homes and vehicles. There are 13 million households in the United States with children that contain at least, at least one gun. The majority of children in gun owning households actually know where the gun is stored. I, I think we're, as, as parents, we know our, our kids are not 
not stupid. <laughs> they really know what's going on. Um, and they, they know this. So what do we mean by securing guns? You store a gun securely, inaccessible to kids, and kids should not be in the presence of that gun. Hiding a gun is not securing a gun. Those are two very different things. So what does secure storage look like in practice? Here's some examples, right? There's, there's full-size gun safes, there's lockers, there's consoles, there's gun cases, trigger locks, cable locks. There are different ways to officially store your gun to make it more secure. Um, on our website, we actually have information about all of these. Um, and I put the website at the end of this presentation. Contrary to popular belief, one of the things to share is that locking up guns does not prevent owners from readily accessing their guns. It's a common myth that storage devices negate the self-defense purpose of owning a gun by putting a time-consuming barrier between the gun owner and their means of defense. But the fact is, there's affordable options for secure gun storage that provide owners with access to guns in matter of seconds, but still prevent children and people at an increased risk of harming themselves or others from getting hands on them. We also know that unsecured guns may actually increase the likelihood of crime and violence because of the risk of gun theft. So locking up guns decreases the risk of gun theft, reduces the risk of firearm suicide and unintentional firearm injury. Did you know that at least two guns are stolen every 15 minutes? So you have to remember to lock up your guns. And this goes for cars too. You heard the story of the child who got a hold of the gun in the car. More than half of stolen guns are taken from cars and putting a gun under the seat or in the glove compartment isn't secure storage. They actually do sell things specifically, specifically for cars. So that's our S. M is model responsible behavior. Every law abiding adult has the right to decide whether or not to have a gun in the home, but you can't rely on curious kids not to find a gun. Kids know where their parents store their gun. More than one third of kids in one survey reported that they've handled their parents' guns, many of whom did so, at least a quarter of them, their parents didn't even know that the child had touched the gun that they handled in their house. It is always an adult's responsibility to prevent unauthorized access to guns, not a curious child's responsibility to avoid the guns. It's up to us as adults to prevent this. You can talk to your kids about gun safety. You should talk to your kids about gun safety, but remember it's a precaution, not a guarantee. There was a study that looked at young children went through a week-long gun safety training, but they were just as likely as kids with no training to approach or play with a handgun when they then found that handgun. Modeling responsible behavior means that adults make sure that kids don't have the opportunity to access the guns. In addition, you can't control the environment your child is in all the time, so you should teach them not to touch a gun if they come across it, real or pretend, because Kids have, we have stories, I didn't share any, where kids think a gun is pretend and it isn't. And also give them the tools to get out of a dangerous situation. How do they call? How do they get an adult? Um, but do everything you can to prevent them from getting in those situations to start out with. We do have handouts on how to talk with kids, um, which are on, our, are on our website. As we've mentioned, there are approximately 4.6 children living in a household with one unloaded, unlocked gun. So one of the things that you need to do is you need to ask about fire, firearms in other homes. So you may not own the gun, but if a child goes to another home where there is a gun, you can ask. We as parents ask all the time other parents about safety things they do. Is there a pool? Will there be a lock around the pool? For those of us with teenagers, is there going to be alcohol? Are there parents in the house? You have kids with allergies. You ask about what they're going to eat or you ask about pets. If you have little kids who need car seats, we ask about these things all the time. So we could also ask about guns in the home as part of our conversation. It should be as natural as asking about any other safety issue. So if it's awkward, you can try and make it part of your general safety conversation. 
You can also do it over email or text because we all do that nowadays. Um, it doesn't have to be an in-person conversation. Hey, is parent going to be home? Hey, can you make sure my child wears a seatbelt? Hey, if do you have a gun in the car if you're going to be driving the child? Just with the pool, you can just ask these questions as part of your safety. And if you're going to be asking it in person, practice with someone if it feels awkward. It shouldn't because we worry about our kids' safety. That's what parents do. And this should be part of our discussion. When we get to R, we recognize the role of guns in suicide because access to guns is the difference between life and death. So first of all, as your kids get older, you have to look at your storage uh, methods because as we know, as kids get older, they get much more resourceful. Maybe it's not a cable lock anymore. Maybe it's a gun safe. So they get curious. They figure out how to access the guns. We don't want to do that. Another thing to do is if you know your loved one is in distress, if you are worried about your child, you can remove a gun from your home. The reason is because guns are uniquely lethal. 90% of suicide attempts using a gun end in death. Half of the suicides in the U.S. are gun suicides. What we also know is that 70% of people who survive a suicide attempt never attempt suicide again. 90% have said they're very happy that their suicide attempt failed. But that doesn't happen when they have a gun. So if you can keep a gun out of the hands of somebody who is in distress, I'm sure our law enforcement officers would be happy to help with that. You could also give it to family or friend, give it locked up. Don't give them the key, right? We don't want anyone else to have issues. But but bringing it, it working with law enforcement it, when you have a resource-rich environment like this would be a great way to find out how you can get the guns out of your home. Um, so just remember, most people who attempt suicide do not die unless they use a gun. 41% of child suicides involve a gun. There was a national youth survey in the CDC, that the CDC did that found out that 20% of high school students had seriously considered attempting suicide within the last year. And I will say that this survey was before COVID. So we all know what the mental health of our children has been like uh, during COVID. So 41% uh, of adolescents in gun-owning households have easy access to gun in the home. Uh, Lee? Did, did you need to jump in? You're on mute. I'm muted. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone, if you have questions about any part of the presentation, instead of raising the hand, please put them in the chat and we will answer those at the end. Thank you. Little bit more, I'm almost done and we can get to questions. 41% um, of adolescents in gun owning households reported that they had easy access to guns. So we need to have secure firearm storage to reduce the risk of suicide. Also keep these resources in mind. Things to look out for, right? Prolonged sadness or depression, changes in mood or behavior, hopelessness, sleeping too much or too little. I know for those of you with teens, um, sleeping too much is you know something we deal with all the time as well as withdrawal, but seeing a change in your child's behavior is something that you need to keep an eye on. Um, alcohol or drug use, obviously. And if they talk about killing themselves, that's, that's a warning sign and we know um, that people who commit suicide or at least attempt suicide have, have usually talked about it beforehand. So these are some resources. American for Foundation for Suicide Prevention actually has uh, an event coming up in Mercer County, a walk with a lot of information that's on October 1st. We have Be Smart partner with them as well. So that's another resource that is available that isn't on this, on this slide. Um, just want to end because I know we're uh, we're getting to to everybody wanting to ask questions, but you want to tell folks that you know um, about the power of being smart. It's important to tell other people because this needs to become part of the conversation. This needs to be how we talk about safety, how we we talk about guns, and how we talk about taking care of our children, how we keep them safe. So think about who you can tell. Think about how you're going to implement this. If you want more information, you can text the word SMART to 64433, which puts you in touch with our organization. 
Um, we have a state Be Smart lead, NJ Be Smart. And we also have a Mercer County, which you in Plainsboro, not to not to put you off. I used to live in Plainsboro, be smart.mercer at gmail.com. Um, you can get in touch with us. That's um, that's my be smart email as well, so that you can can get any information. We're happy to present and spread the word about be smart. So just a reminder, we have an email here, be smartforkids.org. Be smart, secure the guns in your home and vehicles, model responsible behavior around gun use, ask about guns in the home, recognize the role of guns in suicide and tell others about Be Smart. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak and spread this message that I really truly believe so strongly in. Thank you, Lisa, much appreciated. Uh, obviously really important information for our gun owners in the audience and you know please share the uh, be smart program uh, the amazing resources on the be smart website uh, with your friends and neighbors that you know do own uh, with that said we are going to uh, open it up to questions here if you could put your questions into the chat um, i'm also going to include my email in the chat as well so that you have it uh, should you think of something after the fact we will share tonight's presentation, uh, the materials, the PowerPoints, in addition to uh, the video that was recorded this evening, we're going to put that up on the district YouTube channel. So again, uh, it's open session for questions. If you have a question, if you don't mind, uh, just type that into the chat and we'd be happy to answer those questions as best we can. And while you're doing that, I'll just uh, turn it over to our law enforcement partners or any of our other panelists that might have any kind of closing thoughts, if you will. All right, quick closing thought. This is Blue. Hi, Blue. Blue's being trained as a therapy canine. Uh, so he is uh, working with us to learn all the ropes when it comes to therapy work. So he's in multiple classes and only nine months old, but he is probably one of the smallest canines on the planet. So, but he's doing well, but really as police officers, I really think we have a unique perspective in that I can tell you honestly, from experience, I don't think there's anybody better trained to handle crisis situations and individuals who are having an issue, individuals who are having a problem, someone who is, you have a mom who gives us a call at three o'clock in the morning because their child who is suffering from, who has whatever disorder it is or whatever problem they're gonna have is taking a baseball bat to their room or, or is in distress because she's trying to handle a problem. We get these calls every day. We deal with people who have suffered from um, some type of emotional issue or something every single day. And I'm telling you that I am confident I sleep well at night knowing our police officers, and I know I speak for Plainsboro as well, that we get so much training and we get so much information out there and we are constantly training on identification and ways to de-escalate and ways to make the situation better. And not only that, but we're trained in all these things and we are also trained as first responders. So yes, a counselor in a situation where they have a long-term treatment plan for an individual, there's nobody better. But in that crisis situation where you're calling for an officer because someone is violent or there's an issue and we need to do more, there's no better person than a police officer. And you know, I, I would love to argue that with anyone any day of the week, but we deal with it every single day and we de-escalate. And when crisis comes out, we assist them. But if you call a crisis team to your house to get assistance for an individual who's in crisis, you're gonna get a police officer first because they're gonna call us. That's the protocol. So, you know, while we had questions come up, I see you have questions now. So I was just uh, giving you some time on that, but I'm just letting you know, these are other ways that your police departments are also working with your kids and working with families every single day to make things better. You know, you can look at the headlines, you can look at what's going on, but in reality, in the real world, we are de-escalating and we are helping individuals every single day. And it's taking up so much of our day doing that. And we're so glad we're able to at least help on, on these situations. So I see if you have questions, so I can stop talking. And Blue will answer any questions you want. 
right. Um, Marty, anything to add? Any closing thoughts? Uh, again, the chat feature is enabled if you don't mind. If you have questions, just throw those in the chat. Uh, you know, just to echo the chief statements, um, we, we appreciate being here today. We appreciate the relationships that we have with the schools. And um, it's really a community approach. Uh, I think that keeping your ears open, communicating with one another from parent to school, parent to police, um, police to school, I think that's the most important thing that we can do um, to help prevent you know, these types of, of crises from happening here. So we have some questions over here too, so. Great, thank you. Um, so a couple different questions we'll dive into. Um, uh, one question that was asked, uh, any far, uh, firearm incidents in the school district recently? And I think I can unequivocally say, no, there have not been firearm issues. I'm not sure if that's specifically asked about any incidents, but uh, firearm issues, incidents as far as guns going off or being present uh, in our schools. Uh, thankfully, that has not happened. Um, another question uh, with regards to, uh, sorry, I'm going through these now. They're coming in fast and furious. Um, so programming that we do with students in terms of uh, signs and whatnot, uh, there are some programs out there. We do have things in place through our health curriculum, uh, through our school counseling, classroom lessons. Um, you know, they're things specific to mental health, but they're also things specific to signs and symptoms of individuals that might be in distress. I will tell you that many times um, our students are thankfully ones that if they see something, they say something. They're, they're amazing, right? Our kids are amazing at bringing information forward uh, to support an individual or if they see a threat to our school community. Um, and that's something that uh, we're very thankful for. We also, again, I mentioned Gaggle earlier in the in the presentation that monitors the Chromebook usage. That's not just email. That's chat. That's uh, documents that are posted. There's red flags that are that are caught there. Uh, again, preventative measures to get an individual the support that they need. Um, somebody somebody asked about metal detectors. Uh, I you know I will just say that uh, it's not a measure that we've considered as a district, um, and, and you know of course that's something that uh, brings on uh, an, an additional cost. But at this point, you know in conversations with law enforcement and conversations, it's not something that we feel we need in our schools. Uh, that said, it's always something that we're there's always things that we're looking at as a district in terms of you know what are appropriate measures to put in place. So a question came up about uh, what's done regarding school security since the shooting at Uvalde. Um, obviously, a, a, a just a horrible tragedy. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've made uh, updates to our critical response protocols. We've made updates to our, um, our trainings as a district. We've also um, had additional collaboration with law enforcement in light of that. We've, we've attended trainings uh, in terms of checking doors and locks, that is part of the responsibility of our class three officers when they go and walk about the building. We also have security aides in buildings that do the same to make sure that you know doors are not necessarily propped open, that uh, there's not uh, uh, access to an exterior threat per se. So that's regular part of our security plans that are in place. But um, there's always something to be learned um, and doesn't mean that we have to have a, a national tragedy for, for that to happen. That's why our law enforcement collaboration is really important, that we're constantly having conversations with them about how do we get better? How do we make sure that our schools are as safe and secure as they possibly can be? Um, with that said, we, of course, we, we train for probability, right? Um, we can't necessarily train for possibility. Just about anything is possible. And I say that um, that's something that we do everything we can to think through different scenarios that we might encounter with the drilling, uh, with the communication with law enforcement, with the technology notifications, all those things. But um, we do everything that we can as a school district to keep our students safe and secure.
uh, with regards to Raptor, if a, less, uh, if a license is temporary lost or stolen, can we bring in a temporary license? I would have to double check with that, um, but I believe that you should be able to. Um, but if you want to contact me directly, I certainly will answer that question and find out for you. So somebody asked about school transportation uh, in the event there's say, I, I assume you mean when there's a relocation, an incident occurs and uh, students and staff have to relo relocate, relocate it. Of course, there's a transportation element to that. There's plans in place that would uh, communicate to parents on how to, um, where to find their child in the event that we had to relocate them from the building. But that would of course uh, include uh, transportation to the greatest extent possible. We would work with our transportation department, which is amazing uh, to put that in, in place um, as an incident occurs. But thankfully, um, that's not something that we've had to do, but we're fully prepared to do that. Um, class three officers are at school uh, during the school day. Um, it is typically one class three officer uh, per school, although there are occasions where there are multiple, uh, be it for specific events, or there might be shifts that cross over, um, or uh, some other special reason to have an additional uh, presence on site. So just uh, for our, my law enforcement colleagues, anything in particular you, you see you'd like to address question-wise? I saw one that had uh, this um, security officers walk around the perimeter of the school and check the doors. That That is a yes. Um, and they know a store's propped open or that doesn't happen anymore. When we first got them five years ago, they noticed that and that problem has been solved. So um, yes, so they do walk around and do check the doors to make sure they are locked and fully closed. Uh, throughout the day. Yeah, I see some. Uh, what are the protocols or expectations for officers to engage with a potential shooter? This is something we train for every single day, all the time. That's a, it's part of what our we actually even have a rapid response partnership at the county level that trains for these kind of things with other agencies at the county. So we we know we have our protocols. We have what needs to be done. I guarantee you that I don't care who the officer is that comes on scene, we're going in and we are dealing with the threat immediately. That, that's what we're trained to do. Whether it's myself coming from headquarters, any of the other command staff or the officers on scene, every single one of us is trained to handle this threat. And we've, we've been this way. This is how we've trained. Uh, also there for, I'm assuming when they say officers in the school during the day are also there for EDP. Um, you know, the officers are there. The class three officers are there for emergencies. They can they can handle emergencies that take place. Uh, but as far as uh, and Marty, you can jump in too. you know, major incidents, anything we ha we have our patrol officers that would come in and handle the incidents. But if there's something that's an emergency, clearly the, the class three officer can handle that. Yeah, typically our class three officers. Um they'll respond to the emergency immediately. Um, they do their best to stabilize it and make sure everybody's safe and under control. And our full-time police officers will come and uh, normally handle any police reports uh, that may be required. Uh, I see one about the question about where they're stationed for preschool pickup or drop-off. Um, typically the officers will collaborate with the school administration on the best places to be at certain times of the day. And that could vary depending on if there's an assembly, if it's lunchtime, uh, if there's kids using the playground. Um, so their role is really to be uh, where it, they're most needed uh, depending on the time of day and, and what's occurring. So uh, normally they would be out front during pickup or drop off um, unless if there might be some other need somewhere else in the building. But that's typically, like I said, in collaboration with the principals. 
Yeah. And somebody wrote on, because of Uvalde, are the police officers aware of the chain of command and who is in control and makes decisions on the scene so there is no delay in response should something happen? I can tell you unequivocally there will be no delay in response. But thank you for asking. That's all I see. Yeah, go ahead. That's all I see. Uh, a question was uh, regarding gaggle and how we um, do we notify parents. So ideally, of course, we work with parents. If there's a, a concern with gaggle, um, you know, parents would be notified of, of what that concern is. Albeit, um, you know, it depends specifically on what that is. Um, if it's a security threat. Um, they may not be immediately notified for obvious reasons, but uh, if it is a concern with regards to suicidal ideation, for example, of course, 100%, we're, we're reaching out to the parent, we're, we're trying to find the student, you know, assuming that's happening after hours, but during the day, if something comes up in the school day, uh, we're going to make sure that the parents are in the know as appropriate. So uh, we always want to partner with you as a family to provide the support that's needed. I see one that, that I could probably address about. Sure, um, please. So if, if there's a class three, how many class services are in school and do they have a backup if they're not available? So, you know, with any you know workplace, life happens with uh, employees and sometimes things come up. Uh, we always do our best to backfill and replace officers if some if they have an emergency, if they're up sick or something like that. Um, if that is not the case, uh, we still have patrol officers um, out there. And when that occurs, we notify our patrol supervision um, so that there's additional patrols uh, in and around the schools um, if there is a lower level of class threes in, in a particular area. Um, you, you probably see a lot of patrol vehicles during morning drop off and afternoon pickup. Uh, and that's by design. You know, we, we push our patrol officers towards the schools during their busiest times um, just to have that physical presence um, and that visible presence to the public. So. Um, if the class threes are not there, I can assure you that the patrol is aware of that and that there's going to be extra attention um, paid to that school. Um, one of the other questions that uh, came up with regards to election day, how do we secure our schools during election day when we're in session? Uh, I will tell you that uh, we make sure, number one, that any polling is happening in a separate space. That space is secure away from students and staff. There's a separate entrance. We have security on site from 6 a.m., 5 a.m. till 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, we obviously have police presence um, to the extent possible in the area. So we do our best uh, to, to make sure that uh, we're working with both townships. Uh, with that said, I, we're going to wrap it up as far as questions, but uh, Dr. Adderhall, Superintendent of Schools, uh, was able to join us here and wanted to add a few words. Thank you, Dr. McDonald, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, I've had the opportunity to be listening throughout the presentation. I was um, at, a, at one of my children's events, but I've been listening in throughout. So I wanted to thank Chief Carfalo and Officers Latham and, and Sergeant Calrath and, and our guest speaker um, for the Be Smart program. Uh, as well as uh, uh, Dr. McDonald for the presentation. You know, it's incredibly informative, but I hope what you're hearing is a comprehensive um, approach to how we view school security, how we think about school security through the, the aspect of the whole child, through mental health, um, through ensuring that we're focused on uh, learning opportunities, but we're also incredibly grounded in safety and security from the, the physical plant of our facilities, as well as uh, ensuring that you know our our schools are safe places for our students to learn. As a parent of five, I know how scary this is. Um, as a teacher that grew up in the shadows of Columbine, and understanding that you know everything that I have done as an educator has around school security training has been this idea of mass shooter threat. Um, I was an inner city high school principal. 
um, and I've seen weapons in schools in that in that experience. Um, I've some someone that believes it can happen anywhere in any school community. And as a result, I think we have the ultimate responsibility to ensure preparedness. That means that we take every approach and you heard everything from cameras to technology, to personnel, to training, to mental health, to counselors, to nurses, to outside clinicians, to training programs for students, training programs for staff, mental health first aid certification. We, we think of this comprehensively. Um, we have an incredible responsibility. You entrust your children to us each and every day. We, we think about those scenarios. We worry about those scenarios. Um, and, and, we and we try to make sure that we have personnel prepared and trained. So when things happen, and when I say when things happen, I don't want you to think in crisis, but when, when children present with challenges, whether it's they're writing a letter to their counselor on a Saturday saying that they need help because they're struggling with mental health, or they're writing to a teacher because their friend is having thoughts of suicidal ideation, or they've had thoughts of running away, or perhaps there was a fight, or whatever the scenario is, we have personnel 24-7 throughout the week, you know, weekends and whatnot prepared to review materials because we have gaggle. We're able to identify challenges. Our police have access to our cameras. Um, so we train with the Mercer County Rapid Response Task Force. I'm the superintendent re liaison from Mercer County to that task force. Lieutenant Maher from West Windsor PD runs that task force. We've trained in high school South with the entire county's task force. We bring in the county police dogs to train within our schools. We do this work outside so that we are prepared for what if scenarios. So God forbid we ever had to, to step into, um, we can ensure safety. Have we had concerns with students on social media and threats? I would say social media is our greatest challenge. And it, as a parent, it's our greatest challenge, right? Our kids are in places online and under names that we don't know where they are sometimes, right? They all have uh, Insta or Finsta, right? They have their fake account names. They have names that don't represent who they are. Um, they might be gaming. They might be in environments not all kids, but some kids, and not all of anyone does everything, but the reality is that um, social media spreads misinformation. If you've been on Peeps or in we in a WhatsApp group, you know that's true, right? So misinformation is sometimes our greatest challenge. Um, and then when sometimes students lift and send images, we have to take that seriously. Um, and we do do that seriously. And you saw what um, you might recall at the end of last school year, we had two such incidents of concern that impacted North and South community. There were no weapons, but we took it seriously to ensure there were not. We worked in partnership throughout a Sunday and a Monday with law enforcement, with counselors, with administration, with the community to inform everyone what's going on. We take this work incredibly seriously because again, you entrust your children to us. So with that, I'm really um, proud of the partnerships that, that we've established. I, I've had, this is my 14th year in the school community. And um, we have been preparing in partnership together since my first year as assistant superintendent. We started working and bringing the police from West Windsor and Plainsboro together. And we the district hadn't really been doing that much prior to an extent, but not together. We started working together. So when Sandy Hook happened, we'd already been partnering. So when someone talks about Yulveda, I'm thinking about the mass casualty incident of elementary children from over 10, 10 years ago. You know, we were being prepared back then. It took time for our community to believe that class three officers were a, a part of a comprehensive security plan. Um, and this is our fifth year and our contract's up. So we'll be talking about that this year. Right, we're going to be talking about reestablishing the partnership going forward so that we continue this relationship with West Windsor and Plainsboro Township councils and committee. And that that's not a decision that Chief Garfalo and I can make um, and Chief Tavner and I can make. That's a decision the board and the, and the, and the township councils and the township committee in Plainsboro have to make. They have to come to agreement. So we're going to be talking about that this year. And we're going to be working and recommending a continued partnership because we've seen tremendous benefit. And, and I'm um, extremely grateful of the relationship before class three, but the partnerships since class three have only gone to, to new levels of, of community engagement and community partnership. 
Um, so um, with that, by all means, if you have questions about your school, if you have questions about uh, district protocols, by all means, reach out to your building administration, reach out to Dr. McDonald, reach out to myself. Um, and you know whether it's information that requires law enforcement conversation or not, um, we're here to support, we're here to make sure we're educating, we're here to make sure we're providing you the information that, that you need to know as, as parents and to make sure that you feel comfortable with your children and trusted in our schools. I, I, I would honestly say, I don't know many districts that do, I, I don't know anyone that does more. So, I mean, we, we really do believe we have a comprehensive plan in place. And if you look over the last several years, we've added nurses, we've added counselors, we've added mental health clinicians. Yes, we've added um, some additional security and some additional class three, but we've thought of it comprehensively. And we really think that's the most important component is that we need to make sure that it, we're, not, we're not just talking about fortifying our schools. That's, that's not what this is about. We're making sure that we're creating a learning environment that's conducive and that students can thrive within and that we have the necessary supports to make sure they're they're physically safe so they can be and they can be academically successful. Um, and so, you know, with that, I thank you so much for being on the call tonight. I see 107 of you hung out to the end of what I just said. So I really appreciate that. And I want to thank our panel for everyone for giving up their evening to, to be with us and to educate us. And Dr. McDonald, of course, for all that you do for the district. Um, it's really unsung what he does behind the scenes to make sure he's supporting schools day in and day out. So thank you to you. I hope everyone has a great evening. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone.